All right, well, let's get started. So, um, so today in the lecture, I want to talk about um, forward chaining and um, just some uh, on the assignments. Assignment three, grading is in progress. I've emailed to some of you already um, the graded assignment threes, but I'm in the process. Um, assignment four is due Friday and I'll give it, try to grade it over the week and give it to you back on Monday so that um, you have some feedback before the midterm next week. Um, so were there questions? Okay, so one of the reasons I um, want to talk about forward chaining is because in assignment three, um, it became very clear that there's a few things that I didn't explain very well. Um, so I wanted to go over them and also fits with the rest of the scheme of what I want to do. So let's, um, let's go back and let's uh, examine um, the program that, you know, it's not, sorry, not the program, the specification that we wrote for evaluating linear functional programs, okay? Um, and you remember last time we engineered this in the following way. So we have linear natural deduction we know how to translate to the sequent calculus. That was one of our theorems, okay? Um, and we already have a computational interpretation of the linear sequent calculus by pi calculus terms. That gave us an interpretation of linear natural deduction, an evaluation for linear natural deduction by concurrent computation. And now we step back and said, okay, well, the, this computation happens by some kind of uh, state change. Now let's go back to the beginning of the course where we thought about stateful system the way they change state and describe that in linear logic that we have done it at the beginning of the course simply by writing down rules for transitions and that gave us a semantics and so let's try to remember um, how functions were done okay um, so we had three predicates okay so evaluate M with destination X, um, return a value V to destination X, and um, a continuation waiting on X, do something, and pass the result to W. Okay, everybody remember these things? Okay. All right, so what happens for functions? Okay, so we have, for function, we have application, we have lambda abstraction, we have variables, that's what we have to deal with. So the easiest way for me to think about these things is think about the elimination rule first, okay? So let's try to remember. So to evaluate an application MN, M applied to N, with destination W, okay, we make a transition. Okay, so now you guys have to remember how we did that. Okay, how do we evaluate an application? Okay, so we evaluate M. Okay, which destination? A new one. A new one, okay. Remember the way we got a new destination is we quantified it here and we evaluate. And remember where that new one came from on, under our sequence calculus semantics, what was it? A new channel, and where did the new channel come from? From what rule? Cut, Cut exactly, okay. All right, um, so we evaluate that, and what else do we do? Continuation. Yeah, we have to wait for that. The continuation is waiting for x, and what does it do when it gets its argument? Okay, so what we have to do, we have to take whatever we get and apply it to n. And the continuation took three arguments, okay. One is where we have to deposit our result, and where will that be? The w that we started with, right? Okay, good. So that was the first rule. So then the, now we can think about what happens here, okay. So we, the interesting part, if we evaluate the lambda expression with destination x, what do we do when we come to a lambda expression? 
yep, we just return it so that it can interact with its continuation. Okay, and the next thing we write is the interaction rule, right? Because now we imagine this thing being put here because this eval will eventually return the lambda expression. If everything was well typed, m could only ever return a function, would interact with the continuation. So we have to say we have a return of a function lambda y m, which depends on y to x. And we have a continuation that waits on x weights to apply its argument to put the result to w. Okay, so what do we do in that case? Anyone remember? Okay, so we create a y prime. Okay, and? Yep, so we have to evaluate the body of the function, which is m at y prime for y. Um, what destination did we evaluate m with respect to this thing? Yeah, we can put W here, which was an optimization. What we did, what the pi calculus told us that do this with X and then forward X to W, okay? But we can also forward it, we can also value it directly with W, okay? And what's the other thing we have to do? Okay, we have to evaluate the argument. And what's its destination? That's the Y prime, at which we communicate, okay? So what happens is to evaluate a pair, uh, to evaluate an application, you first evaluate the function part, you leave the argument alone. Once you have that reduced to a function, okay, then you evaluate the body of the function, the argument in parallel, synchronizing on, the var on a variable, which is the bound variable. Okay. Um, do we need anything else? Um, Right, we need evaluation of a variable. Eval, when we come to a variable, we need to synchronize on that. And in the pi calculus, what was, what was there? Forwarding. It was the forwarding from x to w, right, because we tied those two together. And how do we interpret that here? Right, it's a continuation. that does nothing interesting with what it gets and returns its result to W. Okay. Um, okay, are we done? Well, we still need to say how to use this kind of continuation. Okay, how does that work? If you return a value v to x and a continuation weights on x to forward it to w, then we return v to w, okay? And all these things are linear, so in this part there's nothing non-linear, okay? So for example, when we, when we do this transition from here to here, you know, this eval goes away and we replace it by an eval and a con. When we go from here, the return and the con go away, we have an eval and an eval, okay? Um, and if you have a return and a continuation, the return and the con go away and we get a new return, okay? Um, we needed persistence, but not for this because this is a linear lambda calculus. We needed persistence for when we had let, bang and let bang, when we want to implement that, we need a persistence. Because somehow we need to um, have things that, are, that, that um, can handle the fact that the variable might be referenced many times. Okay, so now it would be very nice, and in fact it is possible, if you can think of this thing itself as a program. Okay, 
So we already saw that we can run the operational semantics via the interpretation to the pi calculus, and we can run that as a program. Now the idea behind logic programming is that we can take a specification like this, and we, cannot, we, we can think of it not only as a specification on how you change state, okay, but actually as a program that can execute and run, run an evaluation for you. Okay. Um, so the idea is that before, what we had is, okay, um, let's see. So reduction, proof reduction, let's say, as computation. Okay, and that was a highly disciplined style of des describing uh, 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 computation, because by the very fact that it's a proof reduction, for example, we know that the computation preserves types of the terms that are involved, because the types of the terms correspond to the the propositions that's being proven by the program, and so if you do a proof reduction, of course, it will preserve types. We get other things also like um, termination and so on, because proof reduction uh, reduces, you know. Um, the, the, the type um, in, the, in the reductions, the type or the proposition that's being reduced, and so eventually the computation will have to terminate. So there's a number of things that you can kind of get for this from this highly, um, I should say, sort of organized connection between proofs and computation. Okay. Now, logic program is based on a different idea. Okay. The idea here is that, uh, I'll put it in quotes because proof search as computation. Okay? So that we take something, a specification like this, which is a specification on how a state might change, okay? And then the operation semantics just says, go ahead and run this, change state however you will, okay? And see what you come up with, okay? Um, so this is much less disciplined and much more difficult um, in some ways. Um, because here you're very, very closely tied to the logical principle of reduction. Here you can write programs which are completely meaningless. Okay? Um, by completely meaningless, I, I, for example, um, we could l leave out like one of these rules, like we might have forgotten about the last rule. Okay? Um, and the rest of the rules are still there, but they will no longer compute the value for us that we want okay, because we have forgotten one rule. Now, when we designed the logical system, we made very sure that everything fit together because we were checking cut reductions, we were checking cut elimination, we were checking harmony of the connective. So we're basically verifying that proof reduction of the, as computation gave us a very strong um, guarantees about the computation. Here, when you're searching for a proof, you might be able to find a proof or you may not. Okay. But it's still very nice because we can just say this and we can run it as a program and it will do evaluation for us. Okay. And the basic um, computational engine behind this is, uh, behind r running this kind of program is, is forward chaining. Okay. So it goes back to the chaining and focusing calculi. And that was one of the insights behind Andrioli's original paper where he developed focusing because he wanted to use it as a basis for logic programming in the sense that proof search was a foundation for computation. Okay. Um, so if I have time at the end, we'll actually write this program. Okay, because there is a pro logic programming language out there in which you can write this program and you can run it. Okay, so if we're lucky, we may be able to do this today. Okay. Um, but first, I want to talk about some of the principles underlying it because the homework made clear, the last assignment three made clear that um, I didn't do a good job of presenting that. Okay. So, you know, early on we wrote um, rules like, uh, um, okay, so like if you have two dimes and a nickel, you can get a quarter, okay? And we thought of this as a state change thing. If you have a state delta in which we have two dimes and a nickel, then we can change state to um, having a quarter instead, right? So it describes some kind of change of state in the computation, okay? Or in the, uh, in the system that we're trying to describe. Now, we later said that having just these deltas here is not really going to be good enough in order to develop all of linear logic because we, didn't, we couldn't deal with hypothetical inference rules. 
or generally we can't really do with hypothetical judgments when you have implications, nested inside implications. Okay. So what we did is, instead of just having a, uh, this kind of notion of linear inference where we have one state and a forward direction, we just um, change state by applying a rule, okay, we actually change things. So what we wrote is something like delta okay, um, proves uh, some C on the right-hand side. Okay. And so the question is, can we take a judgment like this and somehow recover this intuitive interpretation of state change? Because when we do this, we kind of give it up. We say, well, if you have resources delta, we can prove C. What here we say, if you have this state, we can change to that state. So the question is, how can we recover this? Okay. And so the way we recover this is as follows. Okay. So the way we think about this kind of transition is that um, we have a state delta. We have a D and a D and an N. And... Um, I'm going to use a focusing error here because we're going to do this in a, in a focusing setting. Um, and we have some C. Okay. And we don't really care for a moment about what C is, and we don't really care about delta. But what we do is this state change from here to here turns into a change of the context here where we have our resources from having these resources to achieve our goal, which are unspecified to having this resource to change our goal. Okay. So instead of going left to right, we're going upwards. We don't touch the conclusion. We just change the state on the left-hand side. Okay. So that's the intuition behind what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. Um, so how do we do that? Okay. So the basic engine, like I said, okay, here we go, is going to be this idea of focusing. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. We'll take something like this and we express this as a logical proposition. So as a logical proposition, what does this say? How do we transcribe this? So D tensor D tensor N Lolly Q. Okay. So what we're going to do is the following. Since this as an inference rule can be used arbitrarily often, okay, it's unrestricted. We're going to take this thing and we put it into our context gamma. And so these things here contain all rules, which you can think of as being really inference rules rendered as formulas. So we put them in, con in the context gamma because these inference rules we can use as often as we want, right? The resources here are the dimes and the dimes and the nickels, not the rule itself. The rule can be applied arbitrarily often. So we put it in gamma, okay? Um, so sometimes people say that this kind of thing is an axiom, okay? I like to avoid that because axiom is used in many different ways. Um, but it is a, a representation of an inference rule as a formula, which we put in gamma so we can apply it as often as we want, okay? So now the question is, how can we achieve this as a single step in our derivation, okay? And the way we're going to do this is by applying the idea of focusing, okay? So let's say our state looks like this at the bottom here. So we have gamma, delta, d, d, n, and we're trying to prove c, okay? So at this point, what we could do is um, we could possibly focus on something delta or on d or on d or on n, okay? I'm going to prohibit focusing on d and n by making these positive. Okay, so these are all going to be positive. Um, okay. So at this point, okay, you could possibly focus on C, but we want to ignore C. Okay, so you can focus something on delta, but delta is just going to contain our other resources, other coins that we might have. So it doesn't contain anything we're allowed to focus on because we're never allowed to focus on a positive atom. Okay. Um, okay, so the only thing we can focus is on one of the rules, okay, like this, which are in gamma. Okay, so what happens if we focus on this particular rule? So it stays in gamma, of course. Um, we have whatever we have in delta. And um, we have these, of course. And we have a focus on D plus tensor. D plus tensor N plus arrow Q plus, and we're still trying to prove C, 
Okay. So this is by the focus rule. Focus left on an unrestricted assumption. Okay. So now at this point we can just play through what happens. Okay. Um, in the focusing system, the only thing you couldn't do at this point is applying a the left implication rule here, right? Your hand is forced, which is the point of having focusing. Okay, what do we do in the left premise? We have to prove the tensor, so we, and it's still going to be in focus. Okay, and what do we do on the right side? Okay, so let's think about this one first. What happens here? Blur, right. We lose the focus because it's a positive formula. So we go to that, right? So at this point, there's nothing invertible we can do here. Um, and so the, the whole focusing phase ends at this point. Okay. Um, I'll fill in the deltas and gammas later. Let's see what happens here. Okay. So what happens here is this tensor is in focus. When the tensor is in focus, what do you have to do? You have to apply the tensor right rule. Okay. So. Let me make some space here. OK, so to apply the tensor right rule, we have to prove d plus and focus. And then the other part is to prove d plus tensor n plus and focus. Um, we can do, say, what happens here. We have to prove d plus and focus. And here we have to prove n plus and focus. OK, so that's what it looks like. OK, so when you have d plus and focus on the right-hand side, how, how do we proceed there? Yeah? You can only really apply the identity rule. Right. The restriction in focusing is that if the, focus, if the formula on focus on the right-hand side is a positive atom, then you can only succeed if that atom is in the context, either in gamma or in delta. Now, gamma only contains our rules, so it's not going to be in gamma. So it can only be in delta. So it has to be here. It has to be here. Okay. And so that means that because this is the tensor right rule, it has to be here. And the same thing happens here. This has to be d plus. This has to be an n plus. And this has to be d plus comma n plus. So we get d plus n plus here. And so that means that we need exactly these three resources to prove that. I mean, there's no other way. And so a delta has to come here, and delta has to come here. And these are all closed off. Okay? So if you look at this, um, it, gives you kind of, it gives you a derived rule of inference that says that if I have d plus, d plus, n plus in my context, then, and I decide to focus on this, I get to delta q plus proof c. Okay? That's exactly the rule that we wanted. Okay? Okay. So when we talk about what kind of a derived rule corresponds to a formula, okay, you always assume that this formula is in the context gamma and that you focus on it on the left-hand side. And then you play through what must happen when you actually focused on this. Um, and uh, then you collect at the end what the derived rule would be. Okay. Okay, so that's what I was asking, and apparently it wasn't very clear. Okay. But that's what we're trying to do there. So the derived rule that corresponds to um, the, this formula, which I erased, when everything is positive, okay, is this rule. Okay, corresponds to exactly that rule. Now this is very good news okay, for us in terms of our interpretation, because it means that if you put this rule into our program, then it will actually correspond if you apply focusing proofs to changing the state from here to here in one step. So applying this rule means going from here to here. That's what we want to accomplish. Okay. So we have recovered by focusing our early quote unquote naive okay, interpretation of linear inference as changing state okay, in a slightly more general context where we also have some things on the right hand side that we don't care for the moment. Okay. So all the programs that we wrote, like doing finding a spanning tree or doing blocks world and so on, 
we can equally write these with inference rules or with these kind of formulas, and they have the right semantics. Okay. All right. So, in order to interpret these things here, we need a little bit more. We need the quantifiers. So, I need to talk a little bit about how the quantifiers work. Okay. So that we can actually see what kind of a program to to run. So, I have to talk about focusing and quantifiers. Okay. So, let's um, let's do that. Um, okay, so by the way, in what I call forward chaining, okay, um, the, the idea is that all the atoms get positive polarity, okay, and because if you give all the atoms positive polarity, then a rule like this will correspond exactly to the state transition that we want. If you give atoms negative polarity, then you get something else called backward chaining, and if you mix them, then you get forward and backward chaining mixed, which is a much more complicated operational reading of linear logic formulas. So I'm going to postpone that. So for today, we're only going to interpret all the, all the atoms as being positive so that they have the right meaning as derived rules. Okay? All right, so now the quantifiers. So all these rules have some implicit quantifiers on the outside that are universal over M and N and W and a few explicit quantifiers, which are existential. So let's see what the focusing behavior is of these. So um, we have psi, gamma, delta. And we have, uh, actually, let me see. Yeah, and we should, for completeness, I'm going to do it left and right, even though we're only ever going to use the left rules for these things. OK. So for all x um, of type tau, a, okay. So what we have to think about is this um, invertible on the right. Universal quantifier is it invertible on the right? Okay. So you have to ask yourself: If I prove for all x a, proves for all x a, do I start on the left or on the right? I start on the right because I need to. I can't instantiate the quantifier on the left until I have the parameter that I get from the right rule. Okay. So it is invertible, which means that it looks like this. We add a new parameter n colon tau to the context psi. And then we have to prove a where n substitutes for x. Okay, so that's our for all right rule. If the for all right rule is invertible, then we would expect the left rule not to be invertible. Okay. So you can apply it only when it's in focus. Okay, so let's write that down. We have psi, gamma, delta, and we have in focus for all x colon tau dot a, and we're trying to prove c. Okay, now anybody remember the left rule for universal quantification? Okay, so we want to choose some term, let's say M, which has type tau, okay, in psi, okay, and that but psi doesn't itself doesn't change, gamma doesn't change, delta stays the same, and we're focused on A, where we substitute M for X, and C doesn't change, okay. Okay, so we can instantiate the quantifier, okay, as long as we have a term of the right type, okay. And we have to remain in focus. The interesting things are, well, OK. Let's do the existentials. Um, uh, delta proof exists x. Is the right rule of the existential invertible? No, it should not be, because we might have to wait to introduce some parameters before we can do that. So therefore, we apply the right rule only when, when it's in focus. And so um, the way we do that is we have to find some term m, which has type tau in our current context. And then we do gamma delta proves a with m for x. And therefore, we expect the left rule to be invertible, tau dot a, OK? And of course, you can verify that. But what happens is 
a new n colon tau gets added to the context. And we have um, a with n for x proof c. Oops, small n. So we introduce a new parameter, we substitute it in, and this happens when the existential is not in focus, so it happens while we're doing inversion. Yep? Uh, don't we have to stay in focus on the exist uh, right? Yes. Thank you. We have to stay in focus. The only time when we're allowed to lose focus, there's actually two times, right? When do you lose focus on the right? Right. So if it's, if it's a bang, you lose focus. And if it's a negative formula, OK? So as long as you stay positive, you're still in focus. Negative formulas, you lose focus. OK. OK. All right, so these are the quantifiers. OK, so when we're doing forward chaining, we mostly care about the left rules. And that's because we don't really care what's on the right-hand side in some sense. OK, um, so we need to look at the left rules to see what happens in focusing. So let's do some simple example um, in order to play through focusing. Um, let's see. Can I simplify something from this example? OK, so um, so there's too many quantifiers here. OK, so I'll do a simple thing. So if I evaluate m um, with destination w, or uh, OK, I introduce a new x, and I evaluate m with destination x, and I have a continuation which waits on x and forwards the result to w, OK? So this is a, not a very useful rule, OK? But something I may be able to focus on, OK? So we have to remember that this is for all m and for all w, OK? So there's two universal quantifiers on the outside, OK? Are we OK in this example? Clear what we're trying to do? OK. So, um, OK, maybe I'll do it over here. Give myself some more room. All right, so um, I'm focused on, um, for all m, for all w, um, eval, and eval is positive. MW goes to exist X, um, eval MX, tensor cont X, nothing W. OK. And I don't care about the right hand side, it's just going to be some C. OK, so what happens now? The first thing is we have to fill in the universal quantifier. OK, so what we find is that, how do we instantiate that? We have to find some m in psi, which I left out here, which has type, let's say we call it term, OK, some term, OK. Um, and then what we have to prove, um, what remains in focus here is going to be for all w, right? OK, um, and this m gets substituted for this m here. And so then at the next step, we're going to have to find a w, which has type destination. OK. And then we're still in focus on eval mw. And we're trying to prove there exists x eval mx together with cont x blank w. OK. And so. Um, Right. So this, this is a premise, this is a premise, but we still have the same psi here. OK. OK. So now we're focused on that. Now we're focused on an implication. What do we do? <coughs> implication left, which means that over here we have to prove eval of m and w 
in focus, and this is positive. What's oh sequent? Not this is the this arrow. What's the only way to prove that? If it's in the context. So we have eval and w in the context. That must be there. Okay. And these must be well formed. Psi is the same everywhere, right? Because we don't change it so far. Okay, so psi is still going to be here. Okay. That must be the only thing in the context. Over here, we're now focused on exists x eval m x tensor cont x blank w. And the right hand side, I don't care about for now. Okay. Okay. So what happens here? We blur because existential is positive, right? So we're focused on something on the left-hand side. As long as it was negative, we proceed. Okay, when it's positive, we blur. Okay, so we get the same formula. Okay, um, now we're not finished. Okay, we're finished with the focusing phase, but we're not finished with our derived rule of inference because after we apply an inversion, after we apply the focusing, we now have to apply all the invertible rules till we get to what we call a stable sequence, right? Where everything on the left-hand side is negative, on the right-hand side is positive, okay? Except for positive and negative atoms, okay? So in, in uh, weak focusing, sorry, in chaining, we would just stop here potentially. Okay, and focus on something else. In full focusing, we have to continue. Okay, so what's the rule for this do? It introduces a new name into the context. So the context here was psi. So it's psi. So let's call this x to be convenient. There was some type tau, which I didn't specify before. And now I have eval m x tensor cont x w. Okay, what happens from here? Is the tensor invertible on the left? Yes, yes because it's positive. Okay, what does it invert to? Well, it inverts to just putting a comma between the two. Okay, and at that point we stop because these are positive atoms. Okay, so they just end up in the context. So the right hand side is just going to be C throughout. We don't actually fix what that is. Okay, so it's going to be arrow C. Okay. So what does this rule correspond to? Okay. So we must have this eval MW in the context here. Eval MW. Um, eval MW. Okay. So as a derived rule, it says um, if you have an eval MW in our context for some term M and for some W, which are well typed according to these two things. Okay, then we'll replace it with an eval m for an x and a continuation xw, and the x is something new in the context. Okay? So that's what's happening in these rules, right? The universal quantifier just allows you to, allow, to apply this to arbitrary terms which are well typed in the current context, okay? And the existential quantifier here on the right-hand side introduces something new. So as a derived rule, if you if we erase everything in the middle, let's just say, if you have an eval MW, okay, we can get to an eval MX and cont XW with a new X, which is what this weird rule that I wrote over here is supposed to say. Okay. Okay, so the quantifiers work correctly with our intuitive interpretation of these rules, that they work for arbitrary M and N and W, and that the existential on the right introduce new parameters into our proof which we use as destinations or as channels or whatever, however you want to think about it. Okay. Um, does this make sense? The questions on this? Okay. So, uh, right, unfortunately I didn't quite write it far enough, but now I'm going to actually hack. Okay. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Okay. So let's see if we can do this. Okay. 
Could somebody turn off the left blackboard light here? Oh, that was the right one. OK, thanks. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. OK, hopefully something will come up. OK. Um, all right. OK, so we're going to write a program in this language called self, OK, which allows us to in implement these kind of rules that we described before. Um, so I'm going to write a file. Um, what we implement is the linear lambda calculus. I'm going to call it that. That's CLF. OK. So the way we start with this in general is first we have to describe our language. Um, we have to describe which terms are well formed in these contexts psi, okay? Because the terms are the basic objects of our of our uh, of our program, okay? So we have a type of terms. I'm called it TM, um, and then we have some term formers, okay? So we have in this very simple fragment so far we just have a lambda. And we have an application. The application is easy. It takes two terms and gives you a term. Is this, can everybody read this? Is this big enough? In the back row there, are we okay? Yeah, okay. All right, so app takes a term and a term and a term, except I wrote error there. What I should have written is this. Okay, so. Um, so we're using also in the size here, okay, the formation of linear terms, okay. So this basically says that linear variables um, can only appear in the function part or the application part, okay. Um, now lambda is a little bit tricky, and I will talk later about this, but um, let me write it down a little bit here. So the question is, how do I represent lambda y dot m, which depends on y? So if I want to represent this in the framework, how do I do that? So first of all, I have to kind of represent this lambda, which is a constructor. Okay, so that's going to be lamb. So let me say the representation of this in the framework. So this is going to be corresponding to the lambda. Now second, I have to represent the fact that it binds a variable y. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to bind the same variable. So this is the lambda of my programming language, and this is the lambda of the linear lambda calculus that I'm trying to represent. So I'm kind of split it into the two constructs. And then here I have the representation of m, which may depend on y, okay, in this way. So if I think about what's going on here, um, this thing here is a framework function from terms to terms, okay? And the whole thing itself is again a term. So lambda takes a function from terms to terms and gives you back a term, okay? We're going to use these functions to implement substitution where we need it. So, um, So we don't have to pay too much attention to the details of that. Um, but um, I'll just put it there, OK? Um, OK, so that's our little term language. We also have a type of destinations, OK? And there are no constants of destination types because all the destinations that we have will be introduced as the program runs, OK? Um, then the next thing we need is, um, what else do we need? We need eval, return, and cont. So we need eval, return, and cont. OK. So what does eval do? OK, first argument to eval is a term. Second argument to eval is destination. And the whole thing is a proposition, so it would make perfect sense for me to write prop here, okay? But instead of a proposition, we think of it as um, the type of its proofs. So we write type here, okay? Again, now we'll come to type theory later. For now, when I write type here in these things, just think of them as being, as being propositions, because that's a pretty good approximation. 
Now what about return? What does that take as arguments? Term and destination and gives you a type. Now cont was a cont take. First argument is destination. Second argument is it's a frame. And the third argument is destination. And the whole thing is a type. OK, so the question is, how do we type, how do we define a frame? OK, let's look at the example over there. OK, so a frame in this example is like some kind of a term with a hole, right? We've taken it out, and we say we evaluate that, and then we evaluate that. OK, how do you represent a term with a hole? A linear function, right? So the fact that the hole is used only once is represented as a linear function. So Instead of frame, I say it's a linear function from terms, whoops, to terms, OK? So frames are just linear functions because they're terms with a hole. Where you've taken something out to evaluate it, the rest waits, OK? Um, OK, so now we need to describe some of the rules, OK? So like I said, unfortunately, uh, I didn't do a good job of Blackboard management there. So let's see, the rule for evaluating Lambdas, that might be the easiest. Okay. How do I evaluate the lambda? So I would have to write, it's a lambda. Okay, then comes the bound variable at the framework. And then I have m, which can depend on y. And we evaluate that with the destination x. Okay. What does this go to? A return of the same thing and to the same destination. OK, now for reasons which I'm going to sweep under the rug, OK, I need to put braces around this here. And this has to do with being able to combine forward and backward chaining. If we had a pure forward chaining language, I wouldn't need that. But since this language actually implements both forward and backward chaining, I need to tell it more specifically how to use these rules. So I'm going to do it this way, OK? Um, and I'll explain later what that actually is. OK, so that rule was easy, OK? So let's do eval app eval of the application of m to n with destination w. OK. Uh, OK, what does that become? OK, now they can't see it on the board, so somehow has to figure. You have to remember this. It's a good thing to, to practice this anyway before, before the midterm, right? OK, so what do we do? Hmm? What's the right-hand side of this? Yep, we create a new destination as this, x. OK, what do we do underneath? Evaluate m with destination x, OK, and? Continuation x with, with a hole, and pass on result to w. Then for reasons that I am speaking under the rug again, this has to be in braces. What is the uh, frame here? Lambda y dot OK. I'm going to call this h for whole so that I don't get my variable names confused. OK. So this is like underscore applied to n. It's a linear function, which takes the whole as an argument and puts it here in the first part. OK. Makes sense? Are we everybody OK with this? OK. Um, all right, now we have to, they have to reduce when they meet. Let me call that for reduction, okay. Um, so what has to come together here? A return of a lambda y m of y to x with a continuation that waits on x and wants to pass a result to w. And OK, probably for stylistic reason, it would have been good to do it like this. OK. All right, so what do we do in that case? If we create a new y prime, or let me call it uh, z. OK. I evaluate the body of the lambda expression, which is m with z for y. And I do that by doing like that. So m 
this m here is going to be a function because it depends on this y. I'm just going to instantiate with that z. So that's my way of doing seeing z for y and m is by doing this. Yeah? I'm confused about the lambda bodies that are on the like, left hand side of these. Yeah? I mean, <clears throat> so is this like a pattern match? Or what? Yeah. Okay. When you actually run the program, it will do a pattern matching here. Okay. On the actual lambda? It will match lambda. this constant. <laughs> Right. And then this will be a functional matching. So lambda y, m of y is actually equivalent to just saying a variable m, right. except I'm just making the lambda y explicit, eta expanding it. Okay. And aren't we going to need a base estimation? Uh, like the top level estimation? When we run a query, yes. Yeah. So we'll come to that when we run queries. So for now, we're just writing the program. Okay. So we evaluate m, z for y and m with destination w, was it? Um, and what else did we need? We needed to evaluate n with destination z. Did I get that right? OK. Um, uh, so we optimize. Uh, in this rule, I optimized it so there was no continuation. Yeah. OK. But we still have a rule for evaluating. So we have a problem here. OK. And this is a typing problem in that z is going to be of type destination. We're going to instantiate m with that. But z, but lambda wants to take a term as an argument. So we have a mismatch here because this is a term, um, a destination, because it's used here, and as a term here. OK. So we either say term and destinations are the same thing, or we have a way to embed a destination in a term. So I could say this way, uh, we have uh, DST, which takes a destination and uh, gives you a term. OK? So in that way, we can embed destinations in terms. OK. And then here, OK. We say it's the destination z, which we put in for in m. OK, so then we need evaluating variables, which are the destinations. I'm not sure which one is a better way to call it. So if you evaluate a destination z um, and pass them to w, what do we do for that? Yep, continuation, what is it waiting on? And forwards the result to, to W. How do we forward something to W? What does the frame have to do? Hmm? The, identity. the identity function, right? It's just a whole, just an underscore. So it's just lambda h, h. Unfortunately, that's linear. So we're in good shape there. OK, um, we're not quite done yet. We need one more rule. Somebody noticed this before. Yeah, we need a rule for that kind of continuation. So uh, eval slash forward. If we return a value v to destination z, and we have a continuation waiting at z to forward to w, then we return v to w instead. OK? Are we, are we doing OK here? This is uh, extreme programming, right? All of you guys have to make sure that this all makes sense. I'm the only one who probably knows the programming language, so you guys are handicapped, OK? So if something doesn't work, I won't blame you, OK? Um, unless it was something in the logic of the code. All right, are, we, are you clear on this so far? Anybody see anything wrong? OK, so let's see if this program type checks. OK, dot slash self linlam dot clf. <coughs> Oops. OK. OK, this is my fault. OK. The problem is if you put a lowercase x somewhere in a rule, it thinks it's a constant. OK, so it distinguishes between variables and constant by the case. OK. So I have to go through 
sorry about that. And I have to convert these to uppercase. Um, so this x is quantified, so that's okay, but the w here needs to be uppercase. Oops. This needs to be uppercase. Um, I remember my first exposure to type theory is when Jaruet came on sabbatical to, uh, to CMU and gave a talk about computation and deduction. Oops. And he was complaining bitterly about prologue because he had to capitalize all his variables. Okay. So at the time it seemed like a small thing, but now I'm complaining bitterly about my own language that you have to capitalize all the variables. I just haven't come up with anything better. Okay. All right, let's see if this type checks. Did I forget anything? All right, everything type checks. Okay, so we have one systematic bug so far, so this we're doing pretty good. Now, what you see here when it prints it back to you, it tells you, it, it gives you the explicit quantifiers which we omitted. So for example, the application rule, there's a quantifier over M, over N, over W, and it tells you the types that it inferred for these. Okay, so you have some doubts about whether your types are right, you can check there. Okay, so now we actually want to run a program, which would be nice, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So we could also have written pi x, and then we could have made it lowercase. Yeah. Um, but I really wanted to take the rules that were on the board, right? The small modification I needed to make is on the right-hand side of the arrow, I needed to put these braces. Okay. But otherwise, it's pretty much the rules we had on the board. Okay. All right. So now there's a query syntax where you can actually run a query, and I can never remember it. Okay, so I have to do, get the query syntax from here. Okay, so it takes a bunch of arguments. Okay, the first is bound on the number of lead finding for forward chaining. So basically what this says is forward chaining for, at most for D steps. And this is if you have a program which might not terminate, you can force it to terminate by saying forward chaining. So our program should terminate for sure. Um, okay, so I want to put the star there. Second is expected number of solutions. Um, okay, we want to have something that has just one solution. So we'll write a deterministic program. Okay. Um, L, number of solutions to look for. Um, okay, one I think makes sense. Or star means infinite, okay. All right, let's look for, if I put one, one, I'm not really testing anything. If I put one star, then if there's two solutions, it would fail, okay. Um, A is the number of times to execute the query. Uh, I'm happy if it just works just once, okay. And then the type to search a proof of, okay, so we have to translate this into a proposition, okay. So um, what I have to do is I have to introduce a initial destination, you call it D0, okay. And I have to say put eval, okay, some term D0 into the context. And then at the end, we check um, the value V that's returned to D0. Okay, so um, this query does a little bit of working on the right-hand side. So this is your query that's going to end up on the right-hand side. So what the pi on the right-hand side does, look over there, it's invertible. Okay, so it introduces a new parameter, D0, which is my initial destination into the context. Then it adds eval of the term that I haven't put yet with destination D0 into the context. And then it's put this return VD0 on the right-hand side. We said we don't care about what's there. But what we'll do is whatever term, this eval, okay, by forward chaining will run, run, run until it can no longer make a step. We say it reaches quiescence. No steps can be applied, okay? Um, and then we look at the goal and we try to prove that. So this eval will turn into a return of some value to D0, and our goal here will say, we'll check whether we have a return of some value to D0, and that should tell us what the value V was. Okay, so there's a little bit of um, working on the right-hand side going on at the top level. So now we, all we have to do is fill in this term, okay? There's a standard term for all these things, which is apply lambda 
x x to lambda y y. Somehow, this is the the first example. Hmm? Oops, thank you. Okay. Because in linear functional programming without bang, there's not many programs you can write because everything is linear. So we have to at least put in pairs to make it slightly interesting. But OK, so if we did everything right, then this should give us, um, what should it give us? Lambda x, x or something like this, identity function, right? OK, so let's see. Ah, OK. How does it know that V is something we're looking okay. for? Because it's capitalized. Okay. OK. So it's convention bites us again. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, oh, no, I didn't want to do that. Um, what is the file called linlam.clf? OK, lambda y, y. OK, so our program executed correctly. Now, they says solution, blah, it gives us this thing. This thing, actually, is the proof that our query computes to this answer to return VD0. OK, so this is actually a transcript of the computation that happens when this program runs. OK, um, so we will, I will explain later how to read these things and where they come from and so on. So for now, you can ignore that and just say, oh, OK, we got the answer lambda y y, which is a good thing because that's what we would expect. Okay, so our program runs, so we did a pretty good job of programming this. Okay, so we're tempting fate. We'll see if we can uh, generalize this program. Okay, um, so I wanted to add pairs. Okay, so I have a pair constructor. Okay, what's the type of the pair constructor? Takes two terms, gives you a term, right? But how do I combine these two terms to give me a term? They're allowed to use the same variables. Not just allowed, but they're forced to use the same variables because we're in a linear lambda calculus. So I have to use this thing, which I have in the meta language. Okay. So pair is applied to a meta level pair where the same variable has to be used on both same variables have to be used on both sides. And then the first projection, which takes the term and gives me a term. And a second projection takes the terms and give me a term. All right. OK, the risk is increasing with every line. Eval pair. Eval, OK. What's the syntax? Pair of, anybody remember the syntax for pairs? Ian, you have used CLF? Yeah, but, I, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm using the, uh, I'm not using the linear functions for the, uh, <laughs> OK. So um, OK. OK. I don't know. Maybe something like this. M, N. I don't know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> With destination X. What do we do in that case? We return the pair, uh, m comma n to x. OK, now before we go on, I'm curious if, <laughs> if I got the right syntax. Yep, amazing. OK, eval. Pi 1, how do we do that? So we eval of pi 1 of m with destination w. Anybody, how does this work, pi 1 at m? Probably want to create a frame. Uh, we need to create a frame, but first we need to create a new variable a new destination, exists x. Then we evaluate m with destination x, right? And we have a continuation, which waits on x. 
oops, uh, okay, some frame and passes the result on to W. Okay, so what's the frame? Pi with a hole. So how do I write pi 1 with a hole? Lambda h, pi 1 of h, right? Okay, then eval pi 2, evaluates pi 2 of m with destination w by creating an exists x, evaluating m with destination x and a continuation that waits on x and waits to take the second projection and pass it in. Okay, now um, there has to be some kind of reduction. Okay, so um, projection one. Okay, how, how's, what's the first projection? How does it work out? If I'm returning a pair consisting of M and N to X, and I have a continuation waiting on X, uh, try waiting to take the first projection. All right. What do I do in that case? Evaluate the first component. Evaluate M with what destination? W. Yeah. Okay. I think that in our semantics we created some intermediate destination or something, but okay, let's do it this way. So then the second projection is return pair m n to x and a continuation that waits on x to take the second projection and it evaluates n, right? Okay, so the query we did last time should be star one, star one, okay, pi, D0, okay, what was it? It was application of lambda x, the first projection of the pair of uh, x comma x, applied to some value, right? And I'm just gonna reuse my generic value, whoops. Somehow LaTeX interferes with my typing here. All right, and I do that, and I see if I'm lucky, I should be able to get a return of some v to d0. I think you need a parenthesis after the application. Okay, thank you. Here? Yep. Oops, okay. Oops, kind checking failed. That's not good. Oh, you need the D0 in the eval. Yeah. All right, V is lambda YY. And there's our evaluation trace. And let's see which rules are being used. Actually, we can read the evaluation trace even if, um, because we can just read the right-hand sides and that tells us which rules was applied. So we, we start by evaluating an application, the eval app rule, which makes sense. Then we use the eval lamb rule. That also makes sense because we evaluate the first part of the application first. And that was a lambda. Then we do a reduction. Okay. Then we evaluate lambda again. Um, and then we evaluate the first projection. Then that means we have to evaluate pi. Now we can project out the first argument, which has become the variable x. And then we get a uh, look at the x, which gives a forwarding, and then we return y. Okay. So just by reading the rule names here and ignoring all the other stuff, you can see in which order our rules were applied. Okay. Um, okay. Do we want to tape, tempt fade mo even more than that? Um, well, yeah, right, we do. Let's do bang, right? Okay, so we have bang. Okay, what is the argument of that? That's just a uh, term and gives us a term, right? But it's one of these things. Okay, 
So this arrow is an arrow that's sort of like bang term linear arrow TM, right? I think those two are actually equivalent. But I'm not so 100% sure about the bang syntax, so I'll write it like this, okay? You and homework explored how that works, right? That this is really the same as doing that. Okay, anyway. So we have that, and then we have a let bang. Uh, okay, what was that? Um, so the first argument to let bang is a term. Okay, the second argument is something that has scope, and the whole thing is a term, right? Now the scope, we said let bang u equals m in n, so what we're binding there is an unrestricted variable u. So it should be term arrow term, correct? Because we can use u arbitrarily, okay? All right, um, okay. Okay, eval, bang, eval, bang, ups, bang of M with destination X. Uh, return bang M to X. Okay, so far I feel in pretty safe grounds here. Evaluate a let, evaluate, let m, lambda u dot n of u. Okay. Um, okay, I think I have to say bang of u here. Because, oh no, here, here. Okay, because it's an unrestricted variable with destination x. How do we evaluate let bang? Anybody remember? Okay, we create an x. Uh, okay, w. We create an x, then we evaluate m with destination x together with a continuation that waits on x and pass the result onto w. And what is the frame? Lambda whole dot whole lambda bang u dot n bang u. Okay. Uh, okay, now we have to do a bang reduction. Um, Okay. Uh, okay, so if you have a return of bang of m to x together with a continuation that waits on x and wants to pass the result to w. That's not right. And pass the result to W. Okay, so what do we do in that case? Anybody remember? Okay, so that was a tricky part. So we do we create a new variable U, which is unrestricted, right? Okay. Um, no, no, because. All parameters I introduce are automatically unrestricted. Okay. And then I return return M to U. Oops. And I evaluate the body of the let, which is going to be N applied to bang U with destination W. Okay? Stop me if it makes no sense. I think that was it, right? Okay. And now, oh, um, so we can't do the variable. Yeah. Hmm? yeah, how do we get the variable? So when, when we hit the u. Yeah, so we need to put a coercion here because u is a destination and I can't substitute a destination here. So I need to say something like DST, right, of u. Okay. Evaluate 
some variable u. So if you're evaluating uh, a destination u, okay, so the problem here is we don't know. It's a different type of variable, right? So we should, we should have some different way of embedding it here. Um, let's call it a unrestricted destination. So this is an unrestricted variable. So we need another coercion here, which takes a destination and gives us a term. OK. OK. Hmm? You want to yes, I do want to capitalize you. Okay. And what do we do in that case? Continuation. Yep, continuation. That synchronizes on U. Capital U. Capital U, yes. And passes the result on to W. And what does it do? Identity. Hmm? Okay, and then we have the forward rule. Okay, so if we have a persistent return of M to U together with the continuation, oops, capital U, a continuation that's waiting on U, identity forward to W, what do we do in that case? Uh, no, okay. Right, we have to, see, we're looking at views, so we have to evaluate a fresh copy of M with destination W. Okay, so here's where the difference between the previous version where we only returned values to linear variables, we return these unevaluated term to unrestricted variables, which means that every time we see the variable, we have to spawn a new evaluation of M. So we have to spawn an evaluation of M with destination W. Okay, this will be a miracle if this works. Uh, so let's see, whoops, did I mess something up here? Uh, let's see if it type checks. Nope, okay. Let, oh, ouch. Yes, let is very much a key word. An unrestricted let. Okay, maybe we have more chance now. Uh oh. When you put it in U test? Yeah. Here, like that. Let's see if that's better. All right, so it type checks. So N here, the body takes an unrestricted thing as an argument, so I need to put the bang here. Okay, so now we want some kind of a query to think our program runs correctly. That will be even more miraculous. Okay, all right. Something very, very simple. What's the simplest thing? Uh, you let. You let bang of lambda x x in lambda bang u dot u. Yes? Is that what you had in mind? But destination d0. And we want to check whether that returns a value v to d0. Wow. It does. Okay, we have computed the identity function three different ways. Um, okay, sure. Tempting fate is our middle name. Okay, 
how do we do that? We apply. That's only. Okay, so we apply. Oh, inside. Okay, inside here, we apply u to. To the application of u to the identity. We could just do the uh, That's not well typed. I don't want to. Uh, the compiler won't catch that because I didn't make this dependently typed, but I'm I'm scared of doing that. Uh, Okay. Whoops. Uh. Hey, we have computed the identity function four ways. Congratulations, guys. Okay. So the good news is that we can take the specification which we wrote down on paper, which seemed like a specification of a the operation semantics of a language, and we can execute it because we have forward chaining. We get forward chaining from focusing. Okay. And there is in fact an implementation um, that um, you'll have the chance to play around with later in the class after, sometime after the midterm. Um, but I, I just think it's really cool because the difference between what we wrote on the board and what our program says okay, um, is basically minimal. I basically wrote down the specification the way I, you know, with a few syntax things, but basically I wrote it down and it runs, okay. Um, all right, so we'll have more to say about this operational semantics uh, uh, later, okay. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do on Monday, wh where I'm gonna go next from here, um, but uh, um, now we have kind of an operation semantics and you might have enough information that you could write your own programs if you wanted to, okay. All right, so I guess I'll see you next week. Um, I have a few homeworks to return. If you gave me hard copy, I have it to return. And I started emailing people's graded homeworks back, so that you should be getting it sometime today. <laughs>